Aloha. Welcome to Waikiki Beach. It's a beautiful day in paradise. My, I'm looking uh, out at the surf towards Diamond Head at a place called Castles that Duke Hanamoku made famous when he rode it from the deep, deep blue all the way about a mile into Waikiki Beach. And it was a day like that yesterday. The sets are breaking way out into the deep blue yesterday, 20-foot swells. And, uh, but there's nothing greater, more powerful than a, not, not a Hawaiian wave, but just next to me is the altar of the Catholic Church and where the Eucharist, the summit, the summit of our faith, uh, is presented every day. This is the Bear Wozniak. Our guest today is Steve Ray, so don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We live in Waikiki Beach, and when you live on, a, on an island, it's really cool because you can check out the surf forecast. and. In, our, in the winter months, the swells tend to come from the north. And in the summer months, they come from the south. And they don't just come from a few miles away or 100 miles away. They're, you certainly don't want to surf waves that are caused by local wind conditions. Um, but you want to surf waves that have been sent over 1,000 or 2,000 miles. So that the deep, big ground swell caused by a hurricane or something that sends surf this way. And um, we got our first really big swell yesterday, 20-foot faces. And a lot, a lot of guys just weren't ready for that. You know, when you surf waves um, in Florida or on the coast of California, where I've surfed a lot of contests in Australia, um, the paddle out to the lineup is often less than a 30-second paddle. It's not that you don't surf that big of waves out there usually. In Hawaii, though, you can paddle out for a, a quarter of a mile, a half a mile, or more out to where the big surf is. We, we paddle through reefs, through deep water. We use the, the riptide from big surf that breaks on the reefs and then channels out like a river through the, through the uh, deep channels between the reefs. We use that like a chairlift. But yesterday the waves were so big that a lot of people were getting caught inside and their paddle muscles just weren't ready for it. You know, they were paddle battling, paddle battling, and oh good, I made it out. And then here comes another cleanup set at a further reef and you're not able to get to deep water because there isn't any deep enough to hold that wave. And so a lot of people were paddle battling yesterday. It just has to do with uh, the thought that in our spiritual life, we need to be ready for the battle. We need to be, we need to have our spiritual muscles exercised constantly. And one of the ways you can do that, of course, the way you do that is through prayer, through meditating on Scripture, but also paddle battle. You know, do you have a prayer list? Do you have people that you're going to battle for that you pray the rosary for every day? My wife and I have this list uh, that we bring to the Lord every morning when we do our morning prayer. And, uh, and part of your place as a Christian is to be a warrior for the Lord. And when you, when you paddle battle, when you, when you pray the rosary and you pray for a certain person, and you, you, you know what happens? You get to see God do stuff. Um, it's like riding a big wave. So we have today, though, with us, joining us, Steve Ray. Do I have to introduce him? He's the, he, he wrote the, the great, the, he's written several books, but the book Crossing the Tiber is one of the two books that brought me back to the Catholic Church. My dad, who was a Catholic deacon, sent it to me, and he just got back from Jerusalem, from Israel. Aloha, Steve. Aloha and shalom. Shaloha. <laughs> That's a good combination. <laughs> I, I have a good friend from uh, Jerusalem who, uh, who, his wife was one of my tandem surf partners when I surfed in France. And I always say shaloha to him. You know, you know, my wife and I surfed there in Tel Aviv. We've surfed in Israel. We tandem surfed in Israel. Wow, there's some, yeah, there's some nice waves there. I've seen them, but you know, I never thought of it in terms of surfing. That's what you think of. I, I do now that I know you more. If I see waves, I'll say to my wife, "Just think, uh, Bear could probably come out here and surf on these." Oh yeah, we did. We did tandem surfing lifts, and people are like, "Never, they've never seen that." In, in, in Israel. Oh, yeah, before. you told me that. Yeah, you, but you told know what? Me that. I thought, I, then, then you go down to this beautiful, picturesque place. For some strange reason, they call it the Dead Sea. And it's so beautiful and it's so pretty. And I thought, oh, I'm going to, why doesn't any, why aren't there any resorts here? I'm going to get a stand, a stand up paddleboard and surf here. And then I, then I put my head underwater for, the, for a moment. Oh. Tell, tell everyone what that means, what happens when you do that. 
Well, I give people instructions on the bus. You do not ever put your head under the water. You do not put your face in the water. You go and you sit down and then you lay on your back and you paddle back and you keep your head out because that water is nine times saltier than the Mediterranean or the ocean. And if it gets in your eyes, it burns. I have to go down with my group with a bottle of fresh water because every time a couple of people get it in their eyes and I have to flush it out of their eyes. Well, I I remember, uh, you know, with my wife Cindy and I go oh this is so beautiful and I'm just going to try it see what happens <laughs> and oh my gosh I she had to lead me up to the shower area and I just stood there no, it's not just it, I mean it hurt you, am I ever going to be able to see it again Lord? <laughs> so um yeah, I've like, seen that happen a hundred times bear I've taken people down there over 80 times to swim in the Dead Sea yeah Float. well they're to float. Yeah, do not put your head, head underwater. So, Steve, how was the trip this time? I know, was this is this the first time you've been back, or is this a few trips you've been since the COVID shutdown? We've been to Lords and Fatima, and we took a group to is- Italy last month, but this is our first trip back in over two years to Israel. We've taken, um, I've been there 180 times, and we've taken 80 different groups, 80 different pilgrimage groups, but for two years to not be there, that was a long time for us. And this time when we went back, it was just such a joyous thing because all of our friends who we work with in the hotels and the restaurants and the bus driver, they all know us. And it was so good to have a reunion. And we had taken up collections during that time to send to some of the Christians, too. So they were so appreciative and happy to see us again. There's just a small. Go ahead. I'm sorry. We had 57 people. No vaccines required anymore. They dropped the vaccine requirements. We had to test before and after we got there and that kind of thing. But testing is the only thing necessary. There's no masks, there's no vaccines. So people can come with us again. And you're going again real real quick, aren't you? We're leaving in three weeks again with 52 people. And then we're going back to Israel in September, November, and December. Uh, that's just, one of these days we'll have to do that together. I, I can't imagine someone more fun uh, to be with than you and more knowledgeable of the, of the Holy Lands. You know, there are so few Christians there, aren't there? There's just so few. Yeah. The percentage is 1.5% or less now. What, per, no, what percent of those are are, uh, or, uh, are Protestants vis-a-vis Orthodox or Catholic? Well, the Protestants are very few because Protestantism just never caught on over there because it's, it's ancient church. And it's uh, – there are what you call Messianic Jews. Yeah. And they tend to be – Protestants that dress up like Jewish people. I know I'll get I'll get a lot of criticism <laughs> for that, but they basically are evangelical theology. Two sacraments, you know, baptism and Eucharist. Uh, they don't call them that though. They're they're basically evangelicals that try to bring back the Jewish flavor. Well, well, well this, but this is what's so interesting because I know people that are really into uh, the Messianic Jewish, and I'm you know we're of course stoked when uh, Jewish people find find their Messiah. Right. But uh, there's so many people that want to go go back and experience some of that sense of ritual uh, that the Jewish um, tradition brings. Uh, they're like starving for a little bit of that. Um, I don't know how to say it, but you know the the, the 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 way prayers are done and things like that. What they really want is the Catholic Church. They just can't say it because yeah. they're Romophobic. Right, and and the, there are about 400 Hebrew Catholics in israel but i'm sure there's a lot more than that because it's like being a muslim who converts to christianity to do that you you get divorced from your family it's a very traumatic thing to do for a a jew or a a muslim to become a christian but the messianic jews there are those there but um that the protestants are very few in that country the majority of the Christians are Greek Orthodox, and almost all the Christians are Palestinians. It's the Palestinians who are the Christians. They used to be, the whole country was Christian. For example, Bethlehem was 100% Christian at one point. Then when my guide, whose name is Amr, started 30 years ago, it was 74% Christian. Now it's 20, maybe 30% Christian. That's how so it, it's, and it's dwindling, and the Christian population is only less than 1.5 percent so they don't really have a voice we are their voice when we come i don't i don't 
work with Muslims and Jews. I work with the Christians because right. I want to support them. You That's bless really them that way. We We're talking and with I, Steve. I'm sorry. I, yeah, Jim, Jim, Jim. We're talking I was with just going to say that yeah. the, the, um, the Christians there are, I'll just really quickly say Roman Catholics, the patriarch who is like the archbishop is in charge of four areas, Israel, Palestinian territories, Cyprus, and the whole country of Jordan. And in wow. all of those four areas, there's only 54,000 Catholics. That is just it's an amazing, amazing, isn't it? Um, and they we, they used to, well, they call it the Holy, Holy, Holy Land, Christian, Catholic, Muslim there. But when you go, but when you go to, um, uh, I mean, Christian, I mean, Christian, Muslim, Jewish there. We're talking with Steve Ray. Um, man, I means so much to me in my life. His, his book, Crossing the Tiber, helped me return to the Catholic Church. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. This is Daniel LaBoon Markham with another episode of Country Up, White. The color white was on my mind one fall day as I was moseying down the old Ronald Reagan freeway through Simi Valley, California. Four white cars, one right behind the other, were coming up behind me at a fast enough clip to cause me to nudge my pickup over to the outside lane. Scurrying by, each car had its own variety of white. Two sort of ugly one not impressive, and one hotter than a brand of iron on a roundup morning. The color white is one intriguing color. Some think of it as just plain old white. For me, white stands a few hands above its compadre colors, as white is something you can easily add any other color and still make beautiful. And yet, white can stand on its own and look mighty fine just as is. Makes me recall when I was a little Catholic boy. Our nun taught us about sin at catechism class. For you Protestants, that's Catholic Sunday school held on Wednesday nights. She would put black spots on a white circle to demonstrate what sin did to our hearts. Well, anywho, in a world that's in serious denial about personal responsibility, a man who is true to himself got to admit that he's accumulated assortment of those black spots. It was Jesus who said the shedding of his blood was the price paid for ridding our hearts of those black spots. By faith, I regularly and humbly apply Christ's blood to my black spots as they seem to come back real regular-like. Darn it anyhow. Something you might want to consider doing for yourself. That is, taking care of your black spots. Jesus is in the business of erasing such things. This is Dan Laboon Markham at CountryUp.org on a journey. This side of heaven. Now you can journey with other men in the adventure of a lifetime, growing in manly virtue and servant leadership through Bears Man Cave non-Facebook community and our three-year school of manliness. Video, audio, and written content, as well as self-assessments help you to chart your new course. Join us at deepadventure.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak, and I want to invite you uh, women to go and join um, our Mama Bears Club at deepadventure.com and the men to join the Bears Man Cave slash Bears School of Manliness. When you become a member of either of those, or you can get a family membership too, you get access to so much of our, our stuff, but one of the things you get, get that's really cool is you get access to all of our long ride home uh, with Bear Wozniak motorcycle TV series, and you get the you get the uh, access to them before they even air on EWTN. Sometimes it's as long as a year. So right now we're releasing episodes of our Hawaii shoot uh, to people that won't be on e EWTN for a while. So come become part of the family. Go to Bear Wozniak Deep .com, Become a Mama Bear or a member of the Man Cave. And uh, by the way, so we the the Man Cave and School of Manliness has 36 months of lessons that that we as as men go through together. 
but we can also give in there we can also give you a username and password for your sons uh, so that they can go through that whole curriculum with you. They're, they, they're, their password doesn't get them into the man cave because that's for adults only. And the women and the and the and the and the and uh, the women and the young the young women and and their, their the daughters too would go through the first year if they like. After that, it gets to be more man man oriented. But we're talking today. So deepadventure.com. And we're talking today with Steve Ray, who just returned. Uh, just returned from Israel. Are you familiar with uh, Arthur Katz? No. He wrote a book called Ben Israel. And uh, there was a, a Jewish co community up in northern Minnesota when I first got out of college. Uh, I got to really know those people. And there's nothing more evangelistic than a than a Messianic Jew, someone that's found Jesus. Uh, but that's a yep. long time ago. I know uh, Arthur Katz has passed away since then. But he was a really beautiful man. And thank God for the Jewish people, because when they give their life to the Lord, they're basically ostracized from their from their family, right? Yeah, and I also think they're one of the main arguments for the existence of God, because you don't find Hittites and Jebusites and Amorites anymore. But God gave a blessing to Abraham. He made a covenant with Abraham, and four thousand years later, there are only thirteen million Jews in the whole world. And yet, That's look at the disproportionate influence they have in literature and science and mathematics and medicine. And they are blessed people, and only thirteen million of them, and they still exist. And I believe that it is because God made a promise to Abraham, and He's kept His promise for four thousand years to this people. Amen. Okay, so let's do something. Let's go on a. Let, let's go on a little journey with you. We, if we get to we get to Israel, we, we get into the airport, and we go to. Is, are you staying at the what what hotel do you guys usually stay at down there? In, do you stay at Tel Aviv the first? No, we go straight up to. Uh, I, I try to only move once during the trip from mm. one hotel to another to keep it down to one hotel. So we get on the bus in the afternoon and we drive straight up to Galilee on Route Six, which is the new highway. And they keep extending it, which makes it easier and easier. So we go all the way up there to the Tiberias, and we stay right on the water. So you can walk out the door and jump into the Sea of Galilee from our hotel. It's beautiful. You know, the Sea of Galilee, especially the north side to me, it's one of the most beautiful places, peaceful places, at least when I was there. And yep. I'm thinking these guys, Peter and James and John, and they left their nets behind and they traveled the world. And I wonder how yep. often... Uh, they longed for that that, yeah, that serenity of Galilee. Yeah. One time, Bear, I tell you, I was I was talking about those guys living up there. I was out running because I I run all the time. My knees are shot. I can't now, but I used to run everywhere. I've run around the Sea of Galilee and I've I, the up Mount really? Tabor everywhere. But I, I ran along the shore and looking for fishermen coming in, and I saw them coming in at five in the morning, and I stopped to talk to them, and only a couple understood English, and I got. A Shimi, a guy named Shimi Cohen, and I asked him a bunch of questions, and he said, "Look, I don't have time to answer all your questions. If you want my, your questions answered, just come out here tonight and go fishing with us, and I'll talk to you all night out on the boat." Well, you know, you would have done this too, Bear. You're an adventurer. I got up, I went back out there at night, and I got in their fishing boat, and I went out fishing with those two Jewish fishermen all night long on the Sea of Galilee, and I realized I was out there with Peter, Andrew, James, and John. They're yelling yeah. back and forth at each other in Hebrew, and I'm saying, "What did he say? What do you say? Do the winds really?" Come I'm big on the shore. What kind of fish are you catching? I just had a million. What side questions. of the boat should you throw the net on? That's right. Were, were that's they right. netting or were they or were they? They uh, used the net. It's a half mile long. They put it in a big oh, circle huge with red kerosene lanterns on either end. And then when we came into the and then they did that in the sunlight and they went up to the mouth of the Jordan River and they uh, tied their boats to the bushes. And they're eating pita bread and hummus and Turkish coffee, and I'm eating with them. And they're yelling back and forth to the other fishermen. Yeah. And then when it got dark, we went back out into the water, went into that semicircle of net. And then my job was with the toilet plunger to go kaploosh, kaploosh. I thought they were making fun with me. But I, re I asked them why. They said, because when you go kaploosh, kaploosh, the fish swim away. And no matter what direction, they're going to go into the circle of the net, and we catch so them. So you're hurting these fish. Yeah, we're hurting like, them uh, into the net, and then they pulled the net in, and we threw them all in the. By the time we were done, I was up to my knees and flopping fish in the bottom. It of the was boat. a fishing roundup. It was. How it many really how many was. boats were out there with you? They they are very much regulated by Israel because they don't want to overfish the sea, yeah. and the police are out there at night. I I've seen out there maybe twenty thirty boats at a time. But I mean, in that, with your crew, how many would were a part oh, of that? Oh, two. It's a small boat, only thirteen feet long and about four and a half feet wide. Yeah, and it's fiberglass. 
and uh, we, we were in that little boat together for the night. So you bring them all the way to shore. That's how you harvest them, as you get them to shore. And then well, into once a... you, they're out in the sea. They pull the net in and pull the fish off, and then they set the net again out there. They don't bring them in until the morning. In the morning, they bring them up to the little harbor they have, and already the refrigerator trucks are already sitting there. They're yeah. negotiating for the fish. I said, how much did you make tonight? He says, $500 for these fish. So I said, well, that's not bad. He said, no, it's a good catch we got today. It's so cool. My, my, you know, my wife's uh, brother, my wife's nephew, my wife's dad, grandfather, great grandfather, great 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 grandfather, all the way back to when they were pirates uh, in Florida, were were commercial fishermen. So she, wow, under, so I, under, I've been around and listened to them talk story. But you know, there's a difference between fishing with a net and fishing with a hook. Yep. Um, to some degree, my life is fishing with a net. I threw out a really big net. My radio show, my TV show and the books, um, it's bringing the fish in. But, um, but a lot of people out there, they're, they're fishing with a hook. Their life is to, is to be a, a friend to other people, to really care about another individual. A lot of times my job is to stir people up so that they find that person who will share with them, like with the fish hook, and will bring them in one at a yeah, time yeah. is how you bring people to the Lord. So some of us who kind of have this bigger voice, we're just there to use the plunger to drive the fish towards the, the people <laughs> who can harvest them. It's, it's the people listening yeah, yeah. that really get the job done. All we kind of do is stir up trouble. You're really good at making analogies. <laughs> I know. And, and, well, in California, as a kid, we used to always say like. I like wanna I like I like wanna go like I was doing this or like and I realized well like is kind of how you make that journey into an analogy but it is true huh there's there's those different types and and so if you're one of those people that doesn't have a big public ministry that's because you're the one really doing the stuff you're bringing and in the, one person they, at a time the magisterium of the church they have a big net 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 is pictured when Jesus meets them on the shore. And you've caught anything, and they say no, and he says, "Cast your net out," and they catch, and they bring in 153 fish. And I, in my book on Saint John's Gospel, I write in there that Saint Jerome said that at the time there was 153 different nations, languages, and tongues. So that net represents the church, and in that church is somebody from every language, nation, and tongue, and, and it represents the universality of That's the church cool. coming in. And Peter being the pope is his job is to drag that net up to the shore of eternity and put it at jesus's feet at the end of time. oh that's so cool and you know what i else? do this story when i'm there I, I do a whole story about that on the shore I, I, you know it's so interesting how the bible says 153 yeah which yeah, is the yeah. n- number of uh hail mary's you say in a full rosary right because yeah. you start out with the three then you take three laps around of 50 which i think is also the original rosary before john paul ii added you know uh, another another um, mis- group of mysteries, uh, t- but you know one of the great uh, experiences of my wife's life is was uh, it, when she went to Israel. She really wanted to experience God in a real personal and deep way, and she had an encounter with the Lord. She thought, well, maybe it'll be at the cross, maybe it'll be at the tomb, maybe it'll be at Mary's house where the Annunciation. It was at the primacy of Peter. And she was so caught up in it that she couldn't talk. And when we ask her about it, she can hardly share it without just tearing up. Tell us about what what is the primacy of Peter that... That's the one at the shore where Jesus fed them the the breakfast? Is that the one you're referring to? Yeah. The church is called the primacy of Peter. And it takes place in John chapter 21 when Jesus has risen from the dead but not yet ascended into heaven during that 40 days. And he meets Peter. And one of the interesting things about that bear is Jesus used to be with them all the time, but now he just kind of drops in and out whenever he wants to. And they don't, they're kind of confused. They don't know what to do. We, we, so we have to stop, up. Steve. Steve, we got to stop. My gosh. We'll be right back. Okay. We're talking with Steve Ray, uh, CatholicConvert.com. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. This is Bear Wozniak with a deep adventure moment coming to you from my home in Waikiki Beach. One of the reasons why Waikiki is the happiest place in the world is because there's so many people experiencing for the first time 
surfing. Even right now, there's surfers right out in front of me. There's about a dozen of them paddling out that are going to go out and surf for the first time in their life. And they fall and they wipe out and they laugh and they giggle. You know, surfers fall more than little children do. We wipe out all the time. The other thing about surfers is we haven't forgotten to play. We haven't forgotten to go out and have fun and frolic with the wave. But you know, in your life, be willing to try something new like these new surfers that are paddling out right here. Be willing to step out and do something. Broaden your life, broaden your life. Maybe you have social anxiety. Go and join, um, join a group in your church. Uh, maybe there's something God's calling you to do. Maybe it's to lead a Bible study. You just don't know how to do it. You're afraid to do it. Step out and do it. Remember Peter, we were there in the, the Sea of Galilee just a couple months ago. Peter had to step out of that boat. And when he did, Jesus was right there to help him. So remember, surfers fall more than anybody. It's okay to fail. In fact, if you're not failing at something, you're living way too far inside your comfort zone. You should always be stretching your horizon. You should always be testing something new. And remember, God has an adventure for you. The most radical thing you can do in life is to abandon yourself to the wild adventure of God's will. And when you do, you don't become less of who you are. You become more like who you are. You're afraid, well, if I do that, God's going to change my personality and I'm not going to be the person I am. The fact is, when you abandon yourself to God's will, that natural gifting that He's given you is filled with the power of His Holy Spirit and you break out into whole new dimensions in your life and a whole new adventure. This is Bear Wozniak from DeepAdventure.com. You can gain traction in the virtues in my book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. And you can be inspired by my personal testimony of heartache and triumph with my book, A Surfing Guide to the Soul, both newly published by Sophia and available at our web store, deepadventure.com and also on amazon.com. Hey, if you haven't been to the Bear Wozniak, deepadventure.com web store, you really will be shocked what we have there. We have all of my books, and since I'm a Benedictine oblate, we have the St. Benedict exorcism necklaces and rings and crosses too, plus tons of cool t-shirts for men and women, wrist rosaries, warrior rosaries, daily inspirational journals for either a man or a woman, and so much more. Our deepadventure.com web store is awesome. So check it out if you want to find the perfect gift. I interrupted Steve Ray, which is really, uh, <laughs> whenever I talk to Steve, I realize that it's like going to a feast and there's always a bunch of leftovers we never quite get to. But we had introduced the, con the, 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 the place called the Primacy of Peter where my wife Cindy had an incredible encounter with the Lord. Tell us again, you were getting, you, were, you, were getting, you know, I, I talk about 60 miles an hour gust to 200. It's kind of like you. <laughs> well, I think Peter Peter had a real encounter with the Lord too there, like with your wife, that that totally changed him. He had already denied Jesus three times in front of a charcoal fire, we're told, up at Caiaphas's house. Now he's down here and he doesn't know what to do. Jesus isn't around anymore. And they just say, Peter says, I'm going back to my old habits. I'm going to go back fishing. You guys want to come with me? And so, you know, instead of instead of being fishers of men, I'm just going to go back and fish because I don't know what else to do. And so they all go with them. But they can't catch the fish because it's night and it's dark and Jesus isn't there. So then in the morning, Jesus is now there and he says, cast your net on the other side and they catch 153. But what's interesting is when they get to the shore, here's here's the, the encounter Peter had with Jesus. Like maybe you're like your wife, but Peter, Jesus asked him three questions and it says in, at a charcoal fire. And I can't read the Bible without asking questions. Right. There. I have to say, why a charcoal fire? Why, why not does just it the say fire? That? Why does it say that? And it's only two times in the Bible that the charcoal fire is mentioned. The first time is when Peter denied Jesus in front of a charcoal fire. A girl asked him a question three times and he denied Jesus in front of that charcoal fire. Now we've got a new charcoal fire and he gets asked three more questions in front of this charcoal fire. It's like they parallel each other. He denied Jesus three times and three in the Bible means ultimate, final. You, there's no recovery from that. But now Jesus in his great love and mag magnitude 
says to Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Three times in front of a charcoal fire. John wants you to notice it's a charcoal fire. That's so and that, cool. The three times Peter was able to redeem himself. And I'm sure Peter wept because it said he was grieved when Jesus said it the third time. Because I think he all of a sudden realized, oh, oh, there's a charcoal fire. Oh, this is the third question. He knows what I did. And I'm so sorry. Lord, I'm so sorry. Right. You know, I love you. Yeah. So powerful. What, what is it? Let's take this a, neck, a step further because it is called the primacy of Peter. His response, Jesus' response to him, in this day and age when, when there's all this hatred against patriarchy, you know, the, the, leadership, uh, the leadership role of men, um, what happened? I mean, at that moment, uh, he told him, feed my sheep, right? Well, one of the things I like about you and what you do is you're not afraid to make a distinction between men and women. Today, our, our culture doesn't want to do that. Our culture is, is trying to mix everything up. And men are men and women are women. And, the, and that's the way God made us to be. I saw a joke today. The woman's pregnant. And she said, doctor, doctor, is a boy or a girl? He says, well, we'll let the kindergarten teacher decide. Oh, <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh, but, that's... Uh, but I, that's one of the things I like about your show is that you you understand the way God made us. But I think in that case, Peter, the Gospel of John mentions Peter t two big times, and and I always say he bookends things. John does. He tells you something important in the beginning. You can expect it to show up again in the end. In the beginning, he says in verse chapter one, verse forty-two to Peter, you will be Simon. His name was only Simon. You shall be called Cephas, which means rock. He even says it right in there. John says, which means rock. So Peter knew he was going to get a name change the first time he met Jesus. And he's going to be called the rock. Now we get to the end of the gospel and he and John reveals how Jesus is making him also the shepherd. Feed my sheep and tend my lambs. And Peter's now in charge of being the shepherd. And he doesn't say it to all of them. He says it to Peter singular. In the Greek, there's plural and singular verbs. He's not saying, I, I want you all y'all to feed right. my sheep. He says, I want you singular, Peter. You feed my sheep and tend my lambs. Tend and feed, Old Testament terms. Feed means to teach. Tend means to govern. That's the Pope's job, to teach and to govern. If he doesn't do those two things, then he's not doing his job. And Peter was given the job to teach and to govern the church and he accepted that job, and Jesus appointed it to him. And then Jesus tells him how he's going to die by crucifixion. That's the, that's the end of the Gospel of John. But, you know, he, he chose Peter because he was perfect, right? Well, you know, I, I did a whole talk on this because people think that he is a bumbling idiot. And in many ways, he was very outspoken and said the wrong thing. But he had a, his house. It was in a very strategic location in Capernaum, right next to the synagogue in the harbor. He, yeah. I think, was a very important civic leader of the, of the community. He had a business with boats and partners, and he had employees. And when he came back after three years, he still had his boats in his house there. Ah, so he had established uh, middle management. <laughs> I think that he, he knew did. How to, he's got yeah. a, he's he's a good businessman. Yeah, he and knew how Jesus, to lead. Hmm. He did. And, and what what God does is he finds people like you who are good at what you do and then he builds grace upon nature. He takes you and what you naturally have, your gifts, and then he builds on that with with grace. He already understood what Peter's job was. Peter was a strong, forceful man. He could lead the church. He could step out and not be afraid. And then he built with Peter's flaws. He but he took what qualities Peter had as a man, and he built upon that with the grace that he gave him through the Holy Spirit. And one, one of the things that he was able to do, even though he was quick to react and quick to speak, is that he could listen. Yeah. I mean, when Paul... When but you Paul, know, yeah. don't you think that God loved it when Peter jumps up and says, I'm not going to let anybody kill you, Lord. I love you. We're going to... And even if he failed to do it, he still, you've got to love that impulse. You've got to love a guy who's ready yes. to jump up and, and defend. And the interesting thing is, Bear, is when Jesus said, do you love me? He uses two different Greek words. He said, do you love me? The, the self-committal kind of lay down your life for me, agape. And Peter says, Lord, you know I'm your friend, filio. Why didn't he say agape? Because Peter had already promised more than he could deliver. Now he's not going to overpromise. He just says, Lord, you know I'm your friend. Peter, do you love me with a non uh, uncommitted, a total commitment kind of love? And Peter says, Lord, you know I, I'm your friend. And, but at the end, Peter did say, I agape you. I have this kind of self-sacrificial love for you. Because even at the end of John's gospel, Peter, Jesus says, Peter, I know you do and you will. Because someday 
they're going to stretch out your arms and take you to a place you're not going to want to go referring to the way he was crucified peter finally at the end really did say i'll give my life for you and he did it yeah and i i, I love his re- his readiness to serve and, yep. and then and then god and and the thing i've noticed too is some of the most effective people in ministry are those that have just converted just experienced a personal relationship with Jesus for the first time or or new converts you don't have to be um, a theologian my mother used to say that the Christianity is an elevator religion you can lead someone through the teaching of the gospel from the time you get on the first floor and get off on the 25th floor you can lead them <laughs> to good. the Lord it, because yeah. it's that simple and Peter though his writings are profound but Peter had this this very simple aggro go for it attitude yep. and then in time god he, and god propelled him into ministry and then and in time uh you know god just worked off the rough edges like a rock like he would like he would yep. with a rock absolutely that's what he does with all of us isn't he because i know my rough edges my wife can tell you my rough edges but the lord he works with us and works with us and he builds more virtue into our life and as we are willing to cooperate with him he does it more well you know wh- where was the place where jesus said to peter upon this rock that was in Caesarea Philippi, right on the Lebanese border. Oh. We go right along the electric fence with Lebanon to get there. And I say to everybody, see those yellow signs on the on the fences? That means that that property on the other side of that fence is landmined. But that's in Lebanon. And so which we go right up to the northern tip of Israel, and there's that huge rock, and it has a big cave in it. And I do a half an hour talk there called Peter, the Rock, the Keys, and the Chair, explaining Matthew 16. Because I said, Bear, why did Jesus walk? This is a two, this is, it takes us an hour and a half to get there in a Mercedes bus, okay? Why would Jesus With leave no the bathroom. Car? No bathroom on the bus, no. <laughs> okay. and, and, and they walk two days at least all yeah. the way up there. Why rugged, go up there? Rugged Pagan country. Territory. Yeah. But I think it's because of the backdrop. Jesus wanted that backdrop for telling Peter he's going to become the rock. Because in front of that rock, on top of it, was a a temple built to the divine Caesar Augustus, a pagan temple. And they threw living sacrifices into the cave. And they worshiped the wrong Lord, Pan. The place was called Panias, the city of Pan. They worshiped Pan there. Now Jesus arrives and he says, look guys, I'm going to have a new rock, not this rock. It's going to be this rock. I'm making Peter the new rock. And it's not going to be this uh, temple. I'm going to build my church. He said Mm. right there, I will build my church. Ah. And it's going to be to the true Lord with a true sacrifice. And guess what they called that cave? It was called the gates of hell. Oh, no. All of that is right there in Matthew 20, 16. Wow. So this is why I say to people, you cannot understand Matthew 16. You are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and I'll give you the keys of the heaven, gates of hell won't prevail. Again. You can't understand that unless you stand in front so of the you, place. So you got to go on a trip with Stephen Ray. Oh, yeah. So where can they find you, Steve? Catholicconvert.com. They can find your website, but not you. You're out somewhere. <laughs> you know what I I, I I call ourselves Deep Adventure Ministries, but you've already you've always got that hat on that looks like you're ready to go out <laughs> into the desert or something. We're talking with Steve Ray, who means so much to my me personally, uh, because it was his book Crossing the Tiber uh, that helped lead me back to the Catholic Church. We'll be right back with my good friend Steve Ray. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. That's right. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting. The Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link, or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak Adventure possible. We invite our mama bears to join our non-Facebook community created just for you, to share the journey with each other and to take the self-guided one-year course on the Virtues Plus. You have free access to all of the Long Ride Home TV show, all of the Bear Wozniak video version of our radio show, plus the Catechism in a Year videos, all at deepadventure.com. is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. 
The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Sophia Institute is asking me to be sure and remind you that they've published two of my books. Uh, the first one is Deep in the Wave, excuse me, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. Came out about five months ago, and, and now uh, um, a, surfer, a Surfer's Guide to the Soul has just come out. And so we invite you to go there, and why not uh, buy both sets? You can go to Sophia, or you can go to our website, or you can go to Amazon. And buy two sets for someone that you really love, and because they're, they're they're easy to read, but they have very deep messages. And we have with us today Steve Ray. Steve Ray, you've written several books, and one of the, give us the titles of your books, and then we want to go back to the one about the rock. Well, first of all, congratulations on those publications. It's not easy to get a book published these days, and Sophia Press is a very reputable publisher. So Thank congratulations you. on that. First of all, first book I wrote was Crossing the Tiber: My Conversion Story. Second one I wrote was Upon This Rock. It's all about Peter and the primacy of Rome and scripture in the early church. The third one was St. John's Gospel, which is 450 pages where I go through and bring out all the Jewish background and all the cultural issues of John's Gospel. Then I wrote, now I have um, also one called uh, The Papacy, What the Pope Does and Why It Matters. And the last, the last one is The Catholic Faith, which is a study of the creeds. Mm. And my one's coming out later this year is a 500-page commentary on Genesis. Oh, well. Which I've, Ignatius Press is publishing, hopefully by the end of this year, early next year. Oh, that is, Ignatius is awesome, too. I just, uh, I, I've been reading the, you know, my commentary on the early church fathers. I've been reading uh, the book of Genesis, you know. It's so amazing how these... Uh, the, the early church fathers, the, their their depth, and of course their use of analogy too. But I'm getting, I'm getting. I see off your whole set right behind you there. That's an yeah. impressive <laughs> set of books there on your left shoulder, which is commentaries of the whole Bible, just using quotes from the fathers of the church. That's an impressive set you have. Right, and then the other side is all their writings. Yep, the uh, Ir Erdman set. I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> I know those sets. <laughs> I remember I walked into a bookstore in near St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, in Stillwater, Minnesota, and I was wandering around going, this is really a cool bookstore. Look what I found. And I got a, a, a two-volume set on the Primitive Church. And then I was over there talking to Jeff Cavins. Have you ever been to Jeff Cavins' cabin? No. Okay. But I, so, I know Jeff Cavins yeah, pretty well. Yeah, I love him. He's a biker, you know. So anyway, I, I, I went over to his house, and I, I was talking about this. Yeah, that, that's it. That's the best Catholic bookstore in the world. So they have all these old books, and so that, that yep. the, both of those sets of volumes, I— I got from them. I just couldn't. Be, I just. Well, this is really cool. What? Who has these kind of books? And here was that's, that's. It's closed now, unfortunately. Um, yeah. But but I just yep. love it. But I what bought a, half my library from them. UPS used to be pulling into my house every day. You know who I'm talking about? What was the name of that? I sure yeah. I can't remember the name. But yep. um, yeah, I just kind of stumbled into it. I was like, wow. What, what, this, but I, I thought I had just found a nook, a little nook where they had some of these really cool books. Then I realized it was the whole store. But, uh, Steve, we're talking about um, the papacy. Why, why is the pope? What, what is his purpose and why, why? You know, Jesus said, I will build my church. He was a builder. He was right. a tech, technon, I think is the word. The yep. only thing we know he ever built was a church. Yep. Do, you, do you think he had a plan for it? Do you think he just randomly just started throwing it together and say, you guys just go out and do whatever you want? Or did he have a, a plan for how to build that church? Well, there's a point where he said that uh, you never go out and start to build a tower unless you calculate your costs and figure out that you know you're going to be able to complete the project. He knew about building. Uh -huh. And he even said that one time. And his father, Joseph, is the one who taught him and how that, to build. But that, but that tower was built on a rock, right? It was. He wouldn't build on a sand because a builder would never build a house on sand. And, and, because, the, and, and Jesus the, even, he and even super, uses that parable. Yeah, he? and they didn't build things out of wood. They built, built things out of rock. Yep, stone or wood, whatever was there, they would use. Yeah. And uh, Joseph is the one that taught him how to do it. So yeah. Joseph, he, you know, I, I, I do a whole talk on Joseph. Fascinating. But Jesus is the builder of the church. He said, I will build my church. And by the way, uh, Bear, he didn't say I will build my churches, Methodist, Baptist, Lutheran, Presbyterian. He said, I will build my church, singular. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and he appointed men to work with him on that. He appointed Peter. 
and the apostles to work with them. But the church is not about the Pope. The church is not about the apostles. The church is about Jesus building his church. And we have good builders and bad builders. We have some smarter and less smarter, whatever. But the church is not about the Pope. Popes come and go. But the church is always going on because it's Jesus building his church. If it was just relying about um, um, uh, relying on a group of men, it would have fallen exactly. a long oh, time ago. If we'd have done that, Bear, the, the church would have been dead in 100 years. Well, the problem with the church is that it's full <laughs> of people, you know, and people are imperfect. <laughs> but in spite of that, God, in spite of that, God's yeah. able to build this church. Yeah. And so what is the, why is that? The primacy of Peter important. Why is that? Why is that role of, of well? It's of a source father, of unity. Papa, Pope. Yeah. It's a source of a unity. When I realized it, when I was a Protestant, there was no source of unity. All that we had was a Bible. You had your Bible. I had my Bible, and we came up with different interpretations of it, and we started our own groups. And pretty soon, you've got all these different groups, all disparate groups, all over the place. Jesus understood that a baseball team needs a captain, a president needs a king or a president. The um, every, every organization needs someone to bring the leadership and the headship to it. And the church is no different. It's a human institution, but it's also a divine institution. And he works divinely through these flawed, fallible men to bring a unity to the church. That's why we're the one holy catholic and apostolic church that's why when peter came in with that fishing net he came in one net he didn't have a bunch of nets and it says that that net was not torn mm. and the greek word is schism that t wow. the, the net did really? not have a schism or a tear wow. it was one church without without a tear schizo and wow. peter at the end of time needs to bring that up to jesus that way but jesus is the builder of the church we just i trust in him even when the church looks like it's going to hell in a handbasket, and sometimes from our perspective, we're saying, oh, my goodness, we got this problem and that problem. Hey, we've never going through anything now that the church hasn't gone through for 2,000 years. Right. And she's still the biggest, 2,000, over a billion members, and we'll, we'll be here and we'll be strong until the day Jesus comes back. Amen. I mean, you know, there's times of contraction. There's times of... of of testing and challenge that just makes yep. it. I know, like, I think about a, the Piston and a Harley Davidson, you know, when there's that there's that time when the fuel is put in and like thinking of the holy spirit and then the the piston closes down on that and 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 it it uh it compresses and then that spark hits it and it explodes and and I look at I look at uh so many men these days and I said you need to have the sound of a Harley Davidson, you need to let the lion roar. You know, there's, there, you know, think about how Jesus had John the Baptist roaring out in the wilderness. Yep. Why would he have such an unusual character? And so yep. I challenge men for you too. During the time of compression, when you feel like things are closing in, the world seems to be falling apart and, and pressing against you, and even the church seems at sometimes to be having its issues. Just get just just let the Lord get small and let the Lord fire that spark and roar. Men need to stand up and speak. There was a story of St. Francis who said about how he came into a small town. And they said, well, who, what, what's our message? Who, what are we going to say? And Francis said, we're only going to speak when necessary. <laughs> well, it's necessary now. Yep. We need to yep. speak. Men need especially need to. How do men make a stand today? And we may even get martyred for it. You know, I have 19 grandchildren, Bear, and I tell my kids, I want you to raise my grandchildren to be martyrs. Right. I want you. I want them to know there's something worth dying for. Yes. And little Maria Faustina says, but Grandpa, why do you want us all to die? I said, Maria, I don't want you to die, but I want you to know there's something worth dying for in this world. Amen. John the Baptist was beheaded, not because he believed in Jesus or preached Jesus. People don't realize that he was killed because he defended traditional marriage. That's right. He d he was defending traditional marriage against the the king, the the uh, king Herod who was having a wife that was his brother's wife. He was caused incest and a dysfunctional marriage and it was an illegal marriage and John the Baptist called him out on it and he got killed because he defended traditional marriage and I think that that is going to be one of our problems in the coming decades is we're going to be in big trouble because of the whole LGBT and our yeah. and the whole view of marriage and it's it's it the, is an we, interesting we have to stand we have to stand for what's true wait the way Jesus created us man and how and do woman. you stand you you know I, I've been telling saying for years um 
run for the school board. Yes, absolutely. Or, or you know, r- run for the local city council. Absolutely. It's a pain. It's a pain, but that's men can stand up. And, you know, I'm tired of going into the church, and it's women doing all the work. Men, go in there and teach catechism, teach confirmation absolutely. classes. I, I, you know, uh, Scott Hunt, his wife, Kimberly Hunt, she ran for city council. Now she's a city councilwoman in Steubenville, Ohio. She's got a voice. She I'm can so make proud things of her. happen. The more we get us Christians, and you know, I can't do it, Bear, because I'm out of the country half the time, and, and I, I'm, I can't do it. But my goal, like you, is to spread a big net and help people to come in so that this person and that person then can do the right. specific things like that. And we would say, support EWTN. Yes. It's the biggest good, net out there right causes. now. Absolutely. Yeah, and good Yeah, and Steve is, uh, support Steve Ray and the, and the great ministry that he does too. But everybody, um, if you haven't been to Israel, Pray about going with Steve Ray, um, and someday maybe we'll go out, you know, together too. I'd love to make a trip with you, but pray about making that trip to the Holy Lands. You will see; it'll change you forever. That experience, Steve Ray. How can people find you? CatholicConvert.com. That's the hub of the wheel. Then I go to the pilgrimage site, our store, free stuff, hundreds of documents people can print for free, all kinds of stuff. CatholicConvert.com that his son gave to him as a Father's Day present, or what was it, a birthday present? I was just a brand new Catholic, and my son said, Dad, I got a website for you. And this was 29 years ago. Why didn't he get Coca-Cola.com? I don't know what's wrong with <laughs> I that kid. <laughs> I, I, it was, and I've had people since then try to buy this website from me. They want CatholicConvert.com. Yeah. I said, not for sale. <laughs> Love you, Steve. Thank, Thank you for you, spending Bear. this hey, time with us. Keep up the great work. Congratulations on those books, and uh, God bless you and all you're doing. You're, I want to go to Israel friend. with Steve Ray. Until next time, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha! Hey, if you haven't been to the BearWoznikDeepAdventure.com web store, you really will be shocked what we have there. We have all of my books, and since I'm a Benedictine oblate, we have the St. Benedict exorcism necklaces and rings and crosses too, plus tons of cool t-shirts for men and women, wrist rosaries, warrior rosaries, daily inspirational journals for either a man or a woman, and so much more. Our deepadventure.com web store is awesome. So check it out if you want to find the perfect gift.